name's Anne Stanley and I worship at St Philip's Church in Skulls. Our reflection today um, is looking at Matthew chapter 13 verses 36 to 43. Let me read it from the Good News Version for you. Its title is Jesus Explains the Parable of the Weeds. When Jesus had left the crowds and gone indoors, his disciples came to him and said, Tell us what the parable about the weeds in the field means. Jesus answered, The man who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the people who belong to the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. And the enemy who sowed the weeds is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvest workers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered up and burned in the fire, so the same thing will happen at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels to gather up out of his kingdom all those who cause people to sin and all others who do evil things. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will cry and gnash their teeth. Then God's people will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Listen then if you have ears. Over the last few weeks, we've heard a lot in the services, newsletters and reflections about what is usually called the parable of the sower. In this parable, the emphasis is on how the good seed can grow strong and true when in good soil and not choked by weeds. But in today's Bible passage, Jesus seems to turn the parable around when speaking to his disciples. And his, in his explanation, he calls it the parable of the weeds. In this parable, the weeds don't just grow up and choke the good seed, and they are actively sown by the devil, and represent actual people who promote wickedness and do evil things in the world. Jesus graphically describes how, just as the weeds are gathered up and burnt in the fire, so the same thing will happen at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels to gather up out of his kingdom all those who cause people to sin, and others to do evil things. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will cry and grind their teeth. I remember as a teenager hearing ministers preaching what we might call fire and brimstone sermons, often based on Bible verses like these, where it was as though the congregation could be frightened into being good Christians by threats of hell and eternal damnation due to sin and wickedness. I've been reading a book by Tom Wright called Matthew for Everyone, in which he describes how often we need to, we react against this, this image of a judgment, judgmental God, by taking the opposite extreme. We say that God would never condemn anyone, or that he will delay the second coming of Christ until all the weeds have been turned into fruitful crops. The latter's a more comfortable image, but just imagine if we interpret that in daily life, there would be no rules or guidelines for living, just total acceptance of all behaviours. As a grandmother, I, if I totally indulge, indulge my grandchildren all day, letting them do exactly as they please and feeding them sweets and ice cream whenever they ask, am I being loving and responsible in my role or showing my love and concern for them? Of course not. They'll end up either physically ill or in a dangerous situation. Perhaps then, instead of recoiling in horror at Matthew's image of God's judgment and rejecting it totally, we can begin to look at it as another piece of evidence of God's love for his world and those who love him. Last week, we looked after our... ...happily building a tower with wooden blocks when the two-year-old came and knocked it down. I told him he mustn't do it, but he deliberately did it again. My response was to remove him from the toys and ask him and sit him on the naughty chair for a couple of minutes. And there was certainly crying and gnashing of teeth at this. But later, when his elder brother was again building the tower, he said he wouldn't knock it down again. How much more is God's judgment a sign of his love for his people and how much he wants to see his kingdom restored for them in glory, peace and harmony when Christ returns. Let's move on to the final verse in the reading. 
Then God's people will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Words are inadequate when in, a, in our minds we try and describe how we would imagine this scene. Let me try and paint a picture of how I see God's kingdom when Jesus comes again. Have you ever gone on holiday in search of winter sun? And when you take off down the runway at night in the middle of winter, the rain and the hail are bouncing on the tarmac and it's cold and dark. Then you get above the clouds and the sun rises and the sky is blue and the light is so bright you have to close the blind on the window next to you. When you arrive at your destination, you step out of the plane to, to glorious warmth and brightness. Your spirits lift as you take off your warm cardigan or jacket and put on your sunglasses. Just before you put on your sunglasses, as you step out of the aeroplane, you're often dazzled. Buildings and people around you look dark, but as though they have bright lights around them and behind them, but they're still recognisable for what they are. And this is how I see it will be when God's kingdom is revealed and God's people meet each other again. What a glorious future to look forward to, but also a warning caveat that convinces us not to be complacent. The reading ends with the words, If you have ears, then hear. If Jesus' listeners needed to hear that, then each one of us must not be complacent about the message of the parable of the weeds either, and beware of being drawn into the wickedness sown by the evil one. As I finish this reflection, can we pray today for any area in our world that we could identify as the weeds, and for the people caught up in them, and for the victims of this wickedness? Let's just pray together. Lord God, as we look at our world, we see so many areas where wickedness reigns. We think of poverty, war-torn areas of the world, child abuse, human trafficking, modern slavery, and racial and religious prejudice. We often don't know how to pray about these things because they seem so immense, but know that you care and will abolish them when Jesus returns and your kingdom reigns on earth. Help us to know how to play our part and stand up against these evils in the meantime and remain steadfast in your love. Amen. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.